It is unique. It's the last of the great Victorian railway enterprises. I think one must accept that. It's a beautiful line, has a lot of unique characters, but BR are not really in this business of national heritage. And that seems to me to be the basis of the argument. For business reasons, within the strict criteria that lay down the financial conditions under which BR operate and our objectives are such that we must ask for closure of this route. Never before have so many people objected, and this time we have MPs from all political parties supporting us. We have local businessmen and the unions. We have councillors of every council, of all persuasions, again, supporting the line. Never before has such a group of people all come together in one common cause. We don't think any government can resist that. Shall we say that perhaps the opposition has been quite well organised and in fact is somewhat more than we, uh, the number of objections in total is somewhat more than we anticipated when we started, yes. William Crackenthorpe lived here in this house from 1790 to 1888 and he owned 12,000 acres all around the house. So of course when the Midland Railway suggested that the railway should come through his property he was naturally very, very annoyed indeed and first of all he um, went out and found one day his favourite wood being cut down by some foresters and he said what are you doing here and they said we're cutting down the trees to make room for the railway and so he said well I'd like you to spare one tree so that I can hang the entire Midland Railway board from it. The uh, story goes back to the 1850s when you had the west coast route to uh, Scotland and the east coast route to Scotland and you had the then infant Midland Railway based on Derby and it was determined to expand and it started to expand first to London and then its great goal was to get to Scotland and it came up with this scheme of uh, doing just that and um, looked at the country that it had to go through and really with the two established companies one on the west and one on the east the only course open to it was to go right over the High Pennines the amazing country um, that was before it in railway terms amazingly difficult and it, it uh, drew up its plans to do so and then um, suddenly it perhaps got cold feet, or, or, or its rivals did. The London North West and the West Coast route said to it, well, why don't you use our tracks instead? And, and so they patched up an agreement. But the uh, companies that were allied to the Midland wouldn't wear this. And so the Midland Railway was in the extraordinary position of having to build a railway it didn't really want to. And to understand the Settle Carlisle, I think you have to appreciate th this fact, that this was a railway that should never have been. And during the time of the railway building, apparently it was just about the wettest point of the century. And in this soggy wilderness um, lived about 2,000 people. The first priority, of course, was to put in a tramway uh, to get the big supplies up for the uh, quarries, for the Bleemore Tunnel. And then the next priority was to get in a large number of huts, and that is what is done. Look up the records and you find children dying off um, at an age of several months. 
There's a particularly sad story uh, of one man uh, who took the bodies of two uh, children down there and the minister hadn't turned up to conduct the service and this man had actually got to dig a grave and put the bodies in and fill it in and say a few rough prayers and then come home again. Line across those heathered fells When crossing Ribblehead Fired up to remember the tale I tell There's Malastang and Age Gill And the Dendil's lovely wild And now we're allowed to slave it From Settle to Carlisle And it's up in the morning That's it wind, snow and hail Hold fast to your hammers, lads We'll lay another rain I think the remarkable thing about Garsdale is the fact that you've got what in effect is like a Midwest town, isn't it? A place just set up in the middle of nowhere mm. which had a life of its own. And of course, Garsdale was also a religious centre too, wasn't it? Where they had services in the waiting room yes. and a harmonium there. Yes. And somebody described the harmonium as a, an ill wind that nobody blows any good. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> probably it was very true yes. indeed. I think the most remarkable thing about Garsdale, though, is the famous tank house, isn't it? Where you had um, uh, 80,000 gallons of water in a cast iron tank and a social centre underneath. Yes, that was right at this end of the station, mm. now completely gone. But it must have been a very lively place in the heyday yes. of Garsdale, or, or Horse Junction, as it then was. It can be very, very beautiful up here, of course, but uh, when conditions are bad, they're really bad. Uh, I always reckon that they get about every 16 years is when you get the worst uh, blow, as you know. The community benefited by the line in winter times, such as we've just been talking about. It was sometimes the only way of getting groceries, livestock, feeding stuffs and that up here uh, for the outlying farms and cottages, you see. And it's rather sorry, they're going, they're going to lose out if the, if the line goes. All right, it, it wasn't used very often for this purpose, but it was a lifesaver when it was, you know. has not been a deliberate policy of running down the railway. I emphatically deny that. Well, I think it's clear, with the benefit of hindsight, that there has been a degree of closure by stealth. I don't personally know how deliberate that has been, but the general cycle of taking traffic away from the line, of rerouting the Notting to Glasgow Express, of closing stations along the line, and then saying right at the end, well, of course, there aren't now enough passengers left to make it justifiable. Uh, that just seems to have been too much of a pattern of coincidence. And I think that there has been a degree of deliberation right through it, which indeed is endorsed by some of the internal British Rail documents which have been leaked.
There seems to have been a definite decision and a distinct change in attitude on the part of British Rail between 1980 and 1982. And somewhere in that time we believe the basic decision to close the line quite illegally at that stage was taken. We believe that they did not accept the Minister's decision that they shouldn't in 1964. They included the closure in their long-term plans in 1966 and 1967 and they've worked relentlessly from that date until today to try and close it. The problems of the Ribblehead Viaduct are of course well known and widely acknowledged. My understanding is however that the structural problems of the line now go far beyond that single cost and crucially are far greater than ever they would have been if reasonable maintenance schedules had been maintained. The, the viaduct has got into its present uh, parlous state by poor maintenance, uh, mainly in the waterproofing membrane, directly under the ballast. It, and this has, over the years, broken down. And the water's pouring down through wet ballast into the arches, then into the piers, right down to the ground. And it's washed out all the bonding agent in the water, leaving uh, pure sand. Uh, we would not deliberately allow viaducts to fall down. I mean, it is a possibility that with a severe winter, some appalling weather conditions, that something could happen. Well, the Riverhead Viaduct is it's a gravity structure, uh, which means that all the parts are always in compression. They're being pressed together. and It can never fail suddenly because uh, it's just a pile of blocks one upon another. The, the stones are cracked uh, due to a geological de-stressing. Uh, they've been highly compressed in the ground before they were quarried. They were taken out and put in the open air where they're no longer compressed. And now after nearly 100 years, they're beginning to feel that there's freedom, even though the weight of the structure is still pressing them down vertically. The maximum compressive strength of the limestone of which this viaduct is made, and this is a core sample, taken from the bridge itself, the maximum compressive strength of this is nine tons per square inch before it fails. That is twice the strength of the strongest concrete that we can make. Well, I would repair the viaduct by filling the piers that are hollow with mass concrete, uh, uh, grouting the piers that are filled with rubble with cement grout, pointing all the masonry outside with cement mortar and uh, resin mortar, filling the void under the deck with mass concrete and most important of all, uh, make a completely sound waterproof membrane all the way across the deck. And this would solve the problem at a stroke. And really we've got to renew bridges, viaducts, particularly the viaducts, of course, the, uh, the most well known is the Ribblehead Viaduct, which uh, really needs replacing if we're going to keep the line in the long term. We're talking here somewhere in the region of five to six million pounds. Um, my um, rough estimate for the work I have described is 500,000 pounds. I'm not a politician, but it, from what I read, it seems obvious that they very much want to shut the line to save money, or they, to think they save money, and uh, they are prepared to go to uh, more or less any lengths to achieve their ends. And I think this is very sad. And, and, and I disapprove of civil engineers, what I would describe as fudging information to achieve political ends. I think they're, they're undermining my profession, because if you can't believe civil engineers, who the hell can you believe?
fact, it would cost the country, not British Rail, but the country, as much to close this line as it would to keep it open. We're thinking in terms of 120 direct job losses amongst British Rail staff, probably two or three times as many as that in the tourist industry, and at the um, extra social provisions such as hospital cars, extra ambulances, extra road building schemes, roads that would run at a loss, of course. So extra road bus services, again, which would run at a loss. So in fact, there is a distinct cost to the country associated with closure of the line. The effects of the closure of the railway line on Settle would be disaster. We depend very heavily indeed on the tourist industry. Our shops, other businesses, our hotels, boarding houses provide a, an enormous number of full-time jobs, not just part-time jobs, but full-time jobs. The knock-on effect, effect of this, I can't really give the exact answer, but so far as BR is concerned, we're talking about 100 jobs. Now, a lot of those people will go on early retirement. Now, you can say, OK, in the future, those jobs won't exist, but that is no different to many other parts of the country. I mean, we are reducing our manpower throughout the entire system, fitting in with economies where necessary. We're trying to be business efficient. And I agree with you, in this particular area, there will be 100 railway jobs going, yes. 100 people, uh, perhaps uh, in Leeds or in Carlisle, uh, well, you could say it wasn't a very significant proportion, but 100 jobs here are very important indeed. If British Rail were to employ the other tactic, if they really were to promote the line, then not only would the employment created by the line actually increase slightly, but the extent to which the tourist trade, which is of very great importance in North, North Craven, the extent to which that would be boosted could provide jobs perhaps well into the hundreds. Now, people have said, ah, oh, yes, but this line is no worse than many others in the provincial services. Now, that's true. I wouldn't deny that. What that does ignore is the £15 million pounds we've got to spend on this line, which, of course, isn't a necessity for many of the other lines we're talking about. Well, we feel it's very peculiar that once they've decided to close the railway line and made the public announcement to that effect, the British Rail should then say, we're going to maximise our revenue. Well, why didn't they do that first? And why appoint one of their best marketing men to close the line? Why not appoint him and say to him, look, go out and do the best you can and get us some money and keep the line open? Perverse as it may seem, once you announce a closure, it's far better than any marketing. Um, Strange, but you have to accept these circumstances. So BR are in the commercial business. Now we would be, we couldn't uh, really make the right decision, could we? Whichever way we go. If you in fact say, right, now in the short term the line is there, a great deal of attention has been focused on it, people want to know what is the settled Carlisle line. We should market it and make money. And this is what we've decided to do, and I think it's quite right and proper. In fact, we're quite pleased with the number of people that have travelled on the line in the past season. I think there'll be even more next year. Transport Users Consultative Committees can hold public hearings, but only to discuss the aspect of hardship, and a very narrow definition of hardship at that. So what hopes have really the consultative procedures over this line got? It's mere, more of a sham. However, the Minister can and has the power to call a full-blown public inquiry if he so decides, and we would urge him to do so. Only by such a procedure can the inevitable charges of deliberate neglect, of economic blackmail and of closure by stealth be either substantiated or repudiated forever. 
We're fighting not just for the one railway line, but for the rural railway lines throughout the length and breadth of this country. Well, I must be a schizophrenic, I suppose, because I, you know, I have a great deal of sympathy with those that, in fact, uh, feel that it is a great national heritage. Well, it's very sad, actually. Uh, I appreciate, I suppose, from one point of view, that when something isn't paying, I suppose that's the way they look at it. For myself, personally, yes, I'm sorry if it has to go. As a businessman, looking at it from the point of view of BR, which we have to, is that there's no case for the retention of this line. 